Football manager can be a hard game to get your head around, particularly if you're a beginner player, but even when you're experienced, there's still things that surprise you in the game. And most of the time you'll learn them from making mistakes. But what if I could stop you making them mistakes in the first place? That's the aim of today's video as we go through five common mistakes that you might be making in FM23. Hi everyone, Jake here for FM Scout and in today's video I'll be telling you mistakes that you should be avoiding in FM23. I'd just like to take a moment though to say a massive thank you to you guys. This is the first vid that I'm recording after we've got the channel back. We've had three come out recently but they were all pre-recorded whilst the channel was down um, and I've asked you guys over the last few days to smash the like button, hit the comment button to help us get back into YouTube's good books in the algorithm let's say. And you guys have absolutely smashed it. Whether you've watched the video, hit the like button or put a comment down below, it's really helped us. Even if that comment was just letting us know what you've had for dinner. It's um, It's been awesome. I haven't been able to get back to every single comment, nor do I think I'll be able to because there were so many. Um, but I have read them all. I'm massively thankful for all of your guys' support and the positivity on the channel. So if we can keep that going, that'll be fantastic. If you find this video useful, smash the like button for us. Subscribe if you haven't already as we get close to 150,000 subscribers and let us know which mistake you would avoid in the comments down below. No, it's a bit early to come with you with all the like and subscribe stuff, but I just wanted to say that big thank you to you guys. And with that being said, we have got five different things I want you guys to try and avoid in FM23. I know a lot of people may have recently got FM23 for Christmas, so happy holidays everyone, Merry Christmas, um, but I imagine there's a lot of people just starting up. But either way, I think this video will be useful whether you're a starter or a more experienced player. But a common mistake I see in football manager players is ignoring player traits. Now these can be so, so crucial in the match engine in terms of getting the kind of results from a player that you would want. Now I'm using a Rangers save that's five years in the future here, and we have this guy, Dion Drenner Beljo, who has became a phenomenal player and has some awesome traits for us. If you do wanna see this video, by the way, it's a rebuild that I did on my channel. One single video that you can find linked in the description down below and um, but he was exceptional like to the point where he's scoring the most goals in all of Europe whilst playing for Rangers and scoring 20 plus in the Champions League and it's because he has some great player traits now attributes of course are the main factor in a player playing well in the match engine but the player traits are also very beneficial now a lot of people will just ignore them will let them develop over time but you can influence these yourself in the training section so a lot of people will go to training they'll focus in on Beljo's strength or something like that his intensity but what you can do yourself to fine tune a player to play perfectly for you is to add a trait to a player or even remove one. Now this is all about what attributes the player has in terms of how likely the trait is to help them I suppose. So if we were talking about Beljo here you have the choice of going to any of your coaches and talking to them about some kind of trait development whether it be movement training, defending, finishing, passing or technique. Now realistically we're not going to put a defensive trait on Beljo here. We're likely going to have something in the finishing department. So if we click on that, you can see a bunch of options that we could ask for. We could ask him to get the long range free kicks trait and eventually he'll train for that over time. But what you will do when you click on it is your staff member will give you a rough idea as to whether this is a good idea or not. So if I say I would like him to attempt long range free kicks, Beljo isn't a great free kick taker. And as you can see, our coach says, this is a poor choice of trait. I wouldn't do this. Now we can either take his judgment here or completely ignore him. But what we can actually do is add traits that can really benefit him. Now, Beljo is a strong player with great jumping reach and he's a very physical presence. So I would suggest he would be a great player with playing with his back to goal. So if I wanted to add that trait in, I could go to movement training. You could take a look for a bunch of them, but one of them will be to play with his back to goal as you can see, they think it's a suitable choice and they're going to start training him to add that trait to his game. Now, certain traits can be super, super useful for a player. Some maybe not so much. For example, the long free kicks trait. I don't know how often that's going to come into play. I also haven't tested every single trait this year to see how good they are. But in recent years, there was an example of, I think it was a trait for the finishing department, which says place the ball in the back of the net. Now, if you added that to one of your players, their chances of scoring went 
up by a massive, massive amount as opposed to the blast in it in the back of the net. Or at least that was the experience I and a lot of other players had. So it's always worth adding traits to your players, particularly ones that will suit your style and your playing style. For example, if you wanted Beljo playing as an advanced forward, maybe playing with his back to goal wouldn't be the best idea. But if you were playing him as a deep line forward, of course, this would really benefit him. So the first common football manager mistake is ignoring player traits. You definitely shouldn't do this. My next tip is all about tactics. Now, I think any player in football manager should be able, if they want to, to experiment with any kind of shape, any kind of roles, and just try what they want until they figure out what works. That's one of the best aspects of Football Manager. However, one of the things that a lot of people will do, that I think is definitely a negative, is avoiding the information that the game's giving you, trying to tell you whether a tactic is going to work or not. Now you have all of this analysis at the bottom here about your tactic after a few games where you'll start to realize where there's maybe some weaknesses and where there's also strengths. But there's one simple button click that I want you guys to always look at before you start running with a tactic and it is simply by clicking this button here. What that's gonna do when I click it, as you see, is it will give you an area of a pitch separated into grids. Now it will tell you exactly which of these areas your tactic covers. What you want is as many green boxes as possible and no big areas of red, because that will mean there's no player coverage in that area. For example, if we take this position here, we can see that's a bright green color because there's plenty of players who are having an influence on that area of the pitch. However, our weakest area seems to be in this attacking midfield spot where there's low influence due to our tactic. Now, one slightly red box isn't terrible at all. And if we actually go back to how the tactic looks, that's because there's no one playing in this number 10 position. But if we started using a tactic like this, let's say, you'll start to see there's some more red boxes appearing and we might struggle with having players in these areas here that are highlighted as red. And that's likely where there's gonna be a lot of space for the opposition and chances can come from. So you want to make sure there's as minimal area of the pitch that is red. There's always going to be some, but it's always worth looking at. I've just dropped a player even further back here, and I'm not saying anyone would run this tactic, but you can see straight away the game is trying to give you an indication that you are lacking players in a certain position here. So it's always worth taking note of the analysis the game gives you when making a tactic before finalizing on it. In doing so, you'll be able to get rid of those few games where it takes you to figure out that the tactic isn't working straight away just by looking at this. Now that's not to say any tactic with red areas will not work, you could definitely tweak it to make it work, but in general, you want as much of this analysis graph covered with green like we're seeing here, so you know that your players are all getting around and covering the right kind of spaces. My next two common mistakes are gonna be about a similar area of the game, which is the dynamic section. If you haven't played Football Manager over the last few years and you haven't been introduced too much to dynamics yet or got used to them, you won't know this, but dynamics can be for me, I always say they are as important as transfers and tactics. For me, it is the holy trinity of these three. You might sign the best players in the world and have a great tactic, but if your dynamics are terrible, there's a good chance your players won't play well. And on the other hand, if you have some average players in an average tactic, but you've got great dynamics, you might see the team performing way above expectation. And if you ignore dynamics, you can see several issues. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is ignoring player prompts. Now, what I mean by this is you will get a clear indication when you're looking at a player as to whether you're going to cause some upset in the squad, particularly when it comes to offering players out. Most of you will know the basics of dynamics. The higher someone is in the hierarchy, the more chance upsetting them will feed back through the team and create some massive unrest. For example, if we annoyed Alexandra Lowry down here, because he's in the other players section, he's not really a key part of the squad, no one's really going to be bothered. However, if we go to Beljo or Ismaili Saar or Bacharina and, you know, really, really annoy them, there's a good chance that will trickle down into the rest of the squad and cause some unrest, lower the dynamics, and then we'll start to play a hell of a lot worse. Now, a lot of the time when you take over at a club, you might want to sell on a bunch of players 
But there's a reason that this doesn't happen in real life. There's a reason the manager doesn't just go into a club and get rid of half of their first team because it's going to cause a lot of unrest and a lot of issues with team cohesion and whatnot. But I know that a lot of you guys will want to do that in Football Manager, but I'd always be careful when you're offering players out that you read the prompts that the game gives you. Again, this isn't as important for the players who aren't as influential, but let's say we took Martin Bacharina here. If we wanted to offer him out to clubs, obviously you'd go onto this section, you click this button here and teams would come in with their bids if anyone was interested. However, what a lot of people will ignore is this in the top left here. It says, my client may not react well to being offered to other clubs. Now, the chances are if you get this message and you offer a player out, he is then going to come to you in some kind of meeting and say, look, why have you tried to sell me? I'm really annoyed about this. And it's going to cause a lot of unrest within that player. And potentially if they are important, that will trickle down into the squad. So if I was taken over at a club like Rangers and I had a player like Bacharina that I wanted to get rid of, I might just have to suck it up and accept that I don't want to sell him because if I do, it might affect the morale of the whole squad. Alternatively, if we were going to sell someone like Alex Lowry, I'd be very happy to offer him out to clubs and not worry too much about what was going to happen after that because it says here, my client would prefer to stay at the club, but he's open to speaking to other clubs. So if I offer him out, he's not going to be too bothered. In fact, he might actually be quite happy with some of the offers that come in. Let's take Boyomo, for example. If we offered him out, my client may not react well to being offered to other clubs. Well, let's test this theory. If I offer him out and hit yes, and then I advance a day or so and scroll all the way to the top up here. It took me a while to get there, but as you can see, we have got Enzo Boyomo asked to discuss his future. Now, already the offers that came in weren't great, so if we decided to reject these and keep hold of Enzo Boyomo, we've now absolutely crushed this man's morale, no matter what happens now, because what we'll do is we'll discuss the issue with him. He'll say, you've decided to offer me around, blah, blah, blah. He's very, very angry. We're then either backed into a corner of apologizing, which will fix the issue right now, but will also likely make his opinion of us a lot worse going forward. Or we can try and convince him, but that never really seems to work. So now we've had to back down. We really appreciate it. We've got absolutely nothing out of this. And now if we look, Enzo Boyomo's happiness has gone down to fairly poor, and that is going to affect the morale. There you go. There's one unhappy player at the club, and the morale has been affected. So it's always worth keeping an eye on this. Make sure you're not upsetting too many influential players, and you're reading the prompts. That's not to say you could never sell a player who it says might react badly to offering them out, but just be careful when you do it. We're going back to dynamics for mistake number four and it's all about promises in Football Manager. Anyone who's played the game for a while now will tell you that promises are the bane of their existence. So often they can completely destroy a team if you make too many of them and then don't fulfill those promises. So I would try under any circumstances possible to avoid promises as much as you can. If you don't know what I mean by promises, often it appears when you're talking to a player or if you're offering a player a contract. For example, let's offer Beljo a new deal here. Now, as a big player at the club, he's asking for quite a lot. He not only wants us to make the promise that we're going to improve our coaching team, he also wants us to win a domestic cup and also wants us to strengthen the attack area, which coincidentally is also the position that he plays. So I'm not too sure why he's bothered about that. But if I was offering him the contract here, I would do everything in my nature to remove and exclude these promises from negotiations. The club might win the domestic cup, we might improve the coaching team, but I forget to sign a striker. Or what happens sometimes is I'll sign a striker, but it doesn't fulfill the promise for Beljo. Maybe he doesn't think that the striker is good enough. Then you'll come to the end of the season, he'll say you've broke a promise, he'll ask to leave the club, and it's very hard to recover from a broken promise. So always try to avoid them where possible. Even if you know that you're going to sign an attacker already, try and get rid of it because the chances are whatever you do won't please these players and things like winning a domestic cup, all it takes is a couple of losses and suddenly you can no longer do that and your player is going to be upset no matter what you do. So always, if you can, try and remove all of these things. It might not always work, but you might be able to get away with it. There we go. He's very happy to enter contract negotiations. He asked for all those promises at the start but because we were able to get rid of them. We have made our life 10 times easier going forward and breaking one of those promises really can upset your whole team. So try and avoid them when you can. And this also leads us quite nicely onto tip number five. Let's see 
what his contract is. Okay, he's asking for a pretty reasonable contract here in my opinion. We're fine in that sense, but quite often you'll enter contract negotiations with a player and you'll see this. Often players are going to ask for yearly wage rises and sell on fee percentages. So many people will just accept the terms, move on and it's sorted. And you can definitely do this and be okay in Football Manager. I'm not saying you can't, but if you want to play in the best way possible, just take your time and actually look into the details of the contract. You don't have to look at every single fee on the screen, but particularly these wage rises, these sell on fees, release clauses, have a look at them and see if they're actually something that you want in that deal, because more often than not, you can get rid of them. Let's start with the yearly wage rise. I always try and get rid of this when possible, because if you do this every few seasons, your club's wage structure is going to go up and up and up. And if your success isn't going up with that, you're going to struggle financially eventually. It will catch up to you and you want to avoid this where possible. Now, most of the time, Time, if Beljo was asking for say 45 grand a week and 10% of a yearly wage rise, if I remove and exclude this from negotiations, which is what I would personally suggest, he might then say, okay, if I'm not going to get a yearly wage rise, I want a wage of £50,000 or £55,000. You might be able to negotiate that down lower, but clearly you'll be able to see the consequences of you rejecting that yearly wage rise. Yes, you're paying more wages now, but overall, it's probably going to be better for you long term. You can decide yourself based on the circumstances if you're happy to do it, but at least look at it and realize that you don't need to have that yearly wage rise in there. And the same goes for sell on fee percentages, which kill me when I don't realize that I've got them on. So always try and get rid of them if you can. Again, he might ask for an extra few thousand pounds a week because you get rid of this. But I would say that it's worth it. The sell on fee percentage, if you read it, is basically if you sell on Beljo, in this case, he would take a 10% cut of whatever that transfer fee is if we ever decided to sell him. Now, if we sold him for 50 million pounds, that's 5 million pounds that we'll never see because it goes straight to the player. Now, if that means paying him a few extra thousand pounds a week, I would not be against that. I would always try, if possible, to remove these and exclude them from negotiations. But just keep an eye on it and avoid the mistake of just going, OK, yeah, nice contract, suggest terms, done. Always try and look into it, remove things that you don't want in there, and you'll surprise yourself with how much you can negotiate these contracts down. But there we go, everybody. That's five things that you should avoid when playing Football Manager 23 if you want to have the most success possible. Even if you're an experienced player, hopefully you didn't know some of these or you've been reminded to have a look into some of these when you're playing. We can all forget from time to time, but if you do these, you'll greatly increase your success rates in your FM23 saves. If you have enjoyed the video, smash the like button for me, comment down below your biggest mistake that people make in FM and subscribe for more. And whilst you're at it, if you want to check out my channel, links in the description down below, I would massively appreciate it. But thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for all the support on FM Scout since we've came back from the channel being down. Have a great holiday period. Enjoy your Christmases, enjoy New Year's, and I'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.